This is what it looks like. You know, pancakes are not supposed to be good looking anyway. They're just flat and small like my boobs, but they do the job just like my boobs do. Welcome to Cook a Book, the show where I cook very badly while I talk about books. For the month of May, I have read five books by five different Asian authors. So I thought for this episode, it would be fitting that I make ube mochi pancakes. If you don't know, ube is made from purple yams and they originally came from the Philippines and they're often used for tons of Asian desserts. Trader Joe's has been putting out more ube products like ube pretzels, which they no longer make, but they still make ube mochi pancakes and waffles. If my dumb ass is able to make these and they still turn out decent, then that's a win for me. Trader Joe's is not sponsoring this video. I am, however, sponsored by Book of the Month. Book of the Month is a super popular and fast-growing online service for readers. Their mission is to promote new and emerging authors for readers to discover new books that they love. So every month, they go through hundreds of book titles and curate five to seven of the best new releases for you to choose from. And it'll be delivered straight to your door. It's totally risk-free, so you can skip any month, any time, and you will not be charged. I have five of Judy's selections with me, but my personal choice would be The Stardust Thief. I am biased though because I did go to the author's Q&A event at the Book of the Month office. But if you would like any of the books that I show, you can get your first box for $9.99 using my code Ready with Cindy. They also launch a new podcast called Virtual Book Tour and is charted already within the first week of its release. The podcast is hosted by two members of the editorial team, which I got to meet at the Q&A. It's recorded live in front of the audience at the Book of the Month headquarters in New York City, which I can confirm is a really cool place. The podcast just gives you a way to look into the minds of writers, get their anecdotes and wisdom, I would recommend it if you're either a reader or a writer. So again, you can listen to it on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, and you can learn more at virtualbooktour.com. All right, let's go ahead and make the mochi pancakes while I talk about the five books that I read. The first thing I'm gonna do is wash my mixing bowl and my pan because I'm behind on washing dishes and I figured if I'm gonna do mundane tasks around my apartment, I might as well force you to wash it with me. But I know a lot of you do chores while watching my videos, which arguably is a chore in itself, and I feel we can just all do it together. The first book that I read is Woman Eating by a Malaysian and Japanese author. This is a debut novel about a mixed race vampire who has this desire to just live normally among humans and chill, but it's kind of inconvenient when you're really, really hungry, for blood specifically, which is like a new kind of hanger. So she's been squatting in this studio in London where other young artists are living in because she's an artist herself. And she's really curious about all all the things that people eat, like the vegetables they grow in their gardens, Japanese food because her father was Japanese. She's curious about boba tea and cake and ice cream, but she can't eat any of those things. Like they don't taste like anything to her. Like if she puts it in her body, her body will be like, what the fuck is this? Her digestion system will not be able to handle it. Which if you think about it, could be a metaphor for why so many Asians are lactose intolerant. She's definitely a depressed bitch. And honestly, if I couldn't eat Japanese food or cake or ice cream or a boba, I would be a depressed bitch too. The only thing she can digest is blood. So she gets pig blood from a meat market in London. She tries really hard to avoid drinking human blood because her mother, who had been the one who turned her into a vampire, has warned her against drinking human blood because she really emphasizes this sense of self-loathing for vampires and how they're disgusting. And she definitely passed on that negative self-language over to her daughter. However, her mother right now is dealing with some mental issues. So now she's being rehabilitated and this is kind of like the first time that the main character is living away from her vampire mother so she's trying to like grapple with that and as she's meeting the other artists in the studio along with falling for this one bland dude I mean I don't know if he's supposed to be bland in a story but I consider him to be bland I feel like if I tasted his blood it would taste like vanilla but she's developing feelings for him anyway even though he has a girlfriend but the biggest thing of all is that she's just dealing with the feeling of depression and loneliness and hunger because the bitch is always hungry so if anything maybe she is quite the most relatable character out there so this book is definitely in this subgenre of sad woman literary novel the difference is that she is a vampire so there is a little bit of flavor with it the novel is very sparsely written just like how I'm gonna sparsely cook this pancake mix because most of the ingredients are already there they combined ube puree with rice flour so I don't need to add any flour or milk I 
am just going to add 3 fourths cup of this mix, 1 third cup of water, 1 egg, and 1 tablespoon of oil. And this will make 4 pancakes in total. So like I said, the novel is very sparse, maybe a bit too sparse for my taste. The writing feels very distant, which you could argue is kind of like the point of the character because she's so distant from the rest of human society. But I wish that we had gotten more from the story so that it could have been more compelling. I think that there are a lot of things that you could say about her mixed race identity or her relationship with her mother, but we didn't really go too deep into that because I know that relationship with her self-loathing mom, that shit is toxic and therefore juicy as hell. One way you can tell that it doesn't really go any deeper is that I have nothing else to say about this book. So I am rating this three stars. The next book that I read is On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. This is by a Vietnamese author. He's more known for his poetry and you can tell that he is a poet just by reading his writing. It's very lyrical and uniquely written. The entire book is a letter that he's writing to his mom. It also goes into his family's history along with some of his own life as a gay man. He grew up with a single mom and some of the things that the book goes into is trauma and domestic violence and addiction. If you're Vietnamese like me, this is just a regular Saturday for you. <laughs> Truly the Vietnamese experience is complete when you sprinkle in a little bit of trauma. I'm echoing the same thing that a lot of people say, which is that his prose is very lovely, very gorgeous, like the title itself. It's the kind of writing that I would normally go for because I love lyrical writing. I love it when authors stuff their prose with a shit ton of metaphors. Unfortunately, this book didn't really hit strongly enough for me to enjoy it beyond like the technical skill of his writing. And I think it's because the book doesn't really have like a focused story to it. The entire book is essentially a series of abstract vignettes, which makes me wonder if this would have worked better as like a poetry collection rather than a novel. Because when I'm reading a novel, like I want a narrative out of it. I want to see a beginning, a middle, and an end. But a lot of it was non-linear in a way that wasn't purposeful. I struggled to figure out a direction that the author was going for. It jumps around so much that the story ends up feeling disjointed, which if you were writing it as like a poetry collection, you wouldn't have this problem. But again, this is supposed to be a novel. So I'm like, where's the novel at? Or maybe I'm just a dumb bitch who can't understand lyrical writing. But I am a dumb bitch who has mixed together my pancake mix. And if this is the first time you're seeing ube, it is supposed to be purple and it smells very sweet and has like a mochi scent to it. So we're gonna go ahead and load it up on the pan. So the writer covers a lot of topics throughout the book and I wish he had expanded on at least one for it to be like a narrative. He talks about being an immigrant in the US or being queer. He talks about being a gay man and his relationship that he had with someone who was struggling with addiction. He also talks about the effects of the Vietnam War. There are some parts where he does talk about his mother and those parts do feel very intimate and personal, but it's not the whole book. I personally would have wanted more substance to go along with his style. Therefore, I am rating this three stars. The next book that I read is The Memory Police. This is by a Japanese author. It's a dystopian novel that takes place in an island near Japan. This island is very mysterious and eerie because a lot of objects disappear from the island without any explanation. A lot of these objects are innocuous things like hats or perfume. If the people on the island have the object that's gonna disappear that day, they all go to the river and they dump it in the river. So for the day where perfume decided to disappear, that river was smelly as hell. On the day that roses disappeared, they all dumped the roses in the river. It was very beautiful, but they're also like, hmm, I feel nothing when I see these roses because they are also starting to disappear disappear from my mind. So it's like they comply with the disappearance, but they don't even know why. Some things even disappear overnight, like they'll just wake up and they feel like something is missing, but they can't put a finger on what it is. And then eventually they just forget about the thing that disappeared. I fucked up my circle. It is no longer a circle. I was too preemptive with this. Oh my god, no! So there's like these layers to how it works. First the thing disappears, then the memory of the thing disappears, and then the memory of forgetting the thing disappears too. Which is kind of like how my trauma works, but I don't think the book was talking about trauma. <laughs> I think what's interesting is the impact of the things that disappear and how it kind of escalates more and more as you read along with the story. Later on, it could be something like calendars that disappear, which means that they can't even keep track of what days have passed anymore. So the book follows a young woman who is a 
novelist, which is a very unlucrative career because nobody really cares about novels on the island. I think it's because like when so many things disappear, so much of what you value in life or the memories that you have or the meaning that you have and take from objects, they disappear too. So then novels don't really become as significant. She still writes her novels anyway. She actually kind of processes the disappearances and the world that she's living in through the novels because you can see parallels in the story that she's writing. But the story begins when she finds out that her editor is in danger from the memory police because if you are one of the people on the island who still remember objects, then the memory police will come get you because you're not supposed to still remember things. So she concocts a plan to hide him underneath the floorboard so that he will not get snatched up. And the whole story doesn't have exactly like a plot or any explanation to why the world is is the way that it is. So if you're expecting that, you will be very disappointed. The weird thing is, I feel like if I had continued listening to the book on audio instead of switching to physical, or if I had just read the book at any other time, I normally would have rated this book three stars. I don't like it when novels are too vague or abstract. Like I need more from it. But for some reason, when I was reading it, I was commuting a lot and doing a lot of things and touching grass. I think that the book provided some sense of escapism that just kind of worked for me at the time that I was reading it. So I'm rating it four stars solely off of the vibes and how engaged I was when I was reading it. This is my pancake. You know, it doesn't look good, but it's gonna taste the same in my stomach anyway. So we're gonna work with it. Wait, let me see if I can hold it up. Ah, ah, oh shit, it burns. This is what it looks like. You know, pancakes are not supposed to be good looking anyway. They're just flat and small like my boobs, but they do the job just like my boobs do. Anyway, the story is abstract as hell. Nothing about the plot moves forward, but somehow I just rolled along with the vibes, I guess. I kept wanting to see what things would disappear and how extreme it would get and what a world would look like with that kind of collective degeneration. When things keep disappearing and then you don't even like care or feel like you're grieving for it because you don't remember it anyway. So it's like this sense of hopelessness but you don't even know why. So maybe I just vibes with this sadness that you can't really explain. You just know it's there. You know that something is missing but you don't know what it is. You can't explain it. I'm still trying to figure out what the purpose of this book was or what the meaning of it is but if I had to guess it might have something to do with the importance of the little things in life, like the sound of a tiny music box or the taste of candy and having a little treat for yourself. But then there's also that layer of the memories with those things too and the memories from the past that you don't have anymore. These memories that arguably make up who you are or show you how to appreciate your life more. The people on the island don't have that. I feel like a lot of dystopian stories tend to show how aggressive this police state can be or a character that starts rebellion and revolts against that police state or some kind of plot with more action but this one was more just about the setting and the main character's day-to-day -day life. So there's no plot, just vibes and I know that I said for the previous book that I didn't like that for that book but for this one, I don't know, it just clicked with me so fuck it, we're gonna go with four stars. After that, the next book that I read was Beyond the Gender Binary. This is a very short, quick little book that I think would be a good introduction for people who are being introduced to non-binary identities. I actually would recommend this to people who are looking to educate themselves because it's such a short book, so it's not intimidating at all. The author is Malaysian and Indian and is non-binary. They talk about how gender is fluid and malleable and it's also a form of creative expression. My favorite part about this book is the second half of it where they provided counter arguments to common things that people People say to criticize the idea of non-binary like how people say there's only a man and only a woman or they think that this is like a new thing that people are doing the author explains how it isn't actually a new thing this is really more of a norm for Western societies when if you look at other cultures gender isn't binary and I also like their arguments about power and how reinforcing this binary is just another way of control and having power Power over people. Ooh, this pancake is looking better. This is what it looks like. You can't tell from this angle, but it looks better than the first one. All right, pancake number three. Let's go. 
I have the book with me, so I'll read out loud some excerpts that I thought were very well articulated. The idea that humans have a binary sex is a relatively recent phenomenon from the 1700s. Before then, it was a widely held belief by experts that humans were inherently both male and female. In the 19th century, scientists believed that binary sex was only possible in white people, who were seen as more advanced than other races. Today, conversations about binary sex erase intersex people who are born outside the binaries of male or female altogether. Ideas of gender, sex, race, and citizenship are constantly being redefined. When it comes to gender and sex, definitions are constantly drawn as a means to exclude us. They used to define sex as what was reflected on an individual's birth certificate. Once that was changeable, they made the definition our genitalia. Once we could change those, the definition switched to chromosomes. Now that there is increasing evidence that chromosomes do not always necessarily align with sex, they are suggesting genetic testing. This is not about science, this is about targeted prejudice. There's also a part that was a response to the common thing that people say, which is why are you non-binary? Why can't you just be like a feminine man or a masculine woman? Like why do you have all these different identities and just like overly complicating things? And they say, rather than considering the existence of multiple genders as a bad thing or even a good thing, why do we need moral judgment of it altogether? There are many ways that people can exist and describe themselves. Why is that a problem? We don't consider remembering everyone's individual name a burden. We just accept that as the way things work. Gender should be the same way. And then the last thing that I'll read, although I, again, I do want to say that there are many points in this book that I think are just well put. While gendered language might be helpful to describe individual experiences, gender neutral language helps us be more inclusive when talking about people. Individual men and women have valid experiences as men and women, but these cannot necessarily be generalized. For example, when we say that women give birth, we neglect that some women are not capable of giving birth, while some trans men and non-binary people are. The gender neutral alternative, people who give birth, holds all of these realities just like the gender neutral siblings includes brothers, sisters, and non-binary siblings. Using gender neutral language isn't about being politically correct, it's just about being correct. Overall, a very short and simple read. I rated this four stars. I just like the way that the author argued their points. Obviously, I would have liked it to be longer and go more in depth, but I think it still serves as a good introduction to the topic and I think would be good to give to people who maybe are not aware of these things but are willing to learn about it. And then the last book that I read is The Subtweet. This is a contemporary novel by an Indian author. This is about a friendship. But if you are familiar with Twitter, then you'll know that the title implies passive aggression and social justice conversations and very insecure egos. That is pretty much the main audience of Twitter. <laughs> the main character is an indie artist and the story begins when their song is covered by an internet famous artist who is also Indian, like the main character. And this is where they start their friendship, even though the main character does feel a sense of jealousy and insecurity that their song was taken by the other artists like instead of being excited for it there is like this sense of competition but they go along with the friendship anyway and as the other artist begins to get more famous dealing with that jealousy and insecurity becomes even harder for our main character one day the main character decides to subtweet the other artists and it just creates this whole internet shitstorm and things just get really messy I feel like it is pretty accurate to the kind of people who subtweet on Twitter I also think it is accurate to the competition that some minorities can feel towards each other when they are in a very difficult industry that doesn't normally accept them. It's always so sad to experience that because even I have felt the judgment of other Asians and I can tell that it comes from a place of projection because if you were really unbothered by it, then you wouldn't care if another person is doing well. But I think because people in minority groups have kind of like a survival mentality or they worry about how our society subconsciously has like a quota system in their brains where they think oh we have this one Asian so it's fine to not necessarily pay attention to like the other Asians it's just like this weird mental Olympics that some people have and rather than our groups actually helping each other out it just becomes unnecessarily competitive for no fucking reason because you're just making the shit up in your head but then again that's what Twitter does most of the time <laughs> Anyway, my four pancakes are done. Let me show you the montage and then we'll dive into the tea of the subtweet. My last pancake turned out perfectly brown. The purple edges are normal. That's just the ube, okay? But you know, this is what good coochie looks like.
I mean, it's pretty simple. It's hard to mess it up. These are as flat as my titties. So I've been subtweeted tons of times before. It pretty much is bound to happen when you are a person that's very visible online. It used to bother me, but now I'm just like accepting of it. <laughs> and I never engage in it because there's no point. I also take note of people who regularly subtweet others, even if it's not me. If they are constantly doing that shit, I make a mental note to stay away from them as well. Because I always view those people as emotionally immature. Because then you already know what their priorities are. They're not interested in having like a productive conversation or trying to correct a behavior. They they just want to be bitchy about it and I feel like the characters in this book are just like the people who constantly subtweet or insert themselves into discourse or make hot take threads and always have something to say so the characters are meant to be very flawed and insecure and unlikable this is where I have mixed feelings because I'm aware of all these things but man the cattiness of these characters and their passive aggressiveness and the miscommunication that's pretty much like the fuel for this story and why why this conflict even happens in the first place. It's so accurate to the people I hate seeing online. So like on a personal level, I did not enjoy it, even though I know that's what the book was trying to do. However, if I were to try to critique it in a fair way, I do feel like the political and racial discourse was very on the nose with the way that the story was conveying because it was basically using the characters as like soapboxes for it. And I also think that if your characters are gonna be unlikable, which they definitely are, I wish that there was a little bit more depth or different perspectives on the racial topics that they were discussing to make me appreciate it more to overlook the characters. Like if the book had given me some kind of revelation that I hadn't thought of before, I would have been like, damn, you know, the characters are annoying as hell, but at least it taught me something or at least it taught me a different way of looking at things. But I don't think it really went in depth as I would like. It's weird because I feel like a lot of people do not like the miscommunication communication trope. And I think people also get annoyed by characters who just make shit up in their heads and try to read between the lines instead of actually having a conversation, which I totally get that. I also do not like those things either. But the thing is like people do that in real life. It's weird because the book is definitely trying to parallel characters who are like that in real life, but I also hate those people too. <laughs> but the book is doing that to make a commentary, right? And I wish the commentary was like a little bit deeper so that I could tolerate the characters better for the sake of enlightenment, I guess. So this is three stars for me, but it if you are someone who loves petty drama on Twitter and miscommunication, then maybe you would like it. For me, mm -mm. props to them though for making it very accurate to annoying people on Twitter. That is about it for the five books I read. I'm gonna finish my pancakes now. Go ahead and unsubscribe.